Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the online worship service of the Ventura Church. Whether you're a regular member, a visitor, or new among us, we genuinely appreciate you and want to welcome you. Let's begin this part of our worship with a prayer. Would you bow with me? Dear Father, we come before your presence this morning humbly, and yet we are encouraged because we know that you have given us power to worship, to love, to care for people, and to be present in this world. We are so thankful for all of those things, for the spiritual blessings we enjoy, for the love of our fellow man, for our neighbors. We're so thankful, Father, for Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection. And we're joyful that we can come together and pray and hear a message and sing Thank you for all those things, Father. Thank you for your presence here today. We are mindful, Father, of difficulties in this world. We are mindful of those who, who are sick and those who mourn, those who have lost loved ones and their families are recovering. In particular, Father, we are mindful of those so affected by the pandemic. We're thankful, Father, that there are resources to help, though we know they're not enough. And we're thankful, Father, that we not only pray for everyone who is affected, that we are doing whatever we can on a physical level to help. And we pray that you would guide us to those who need it, that we can provide services that are needed. We're especially mindful, Father, of those who have lost jobs, those who need food, those who need lodging. Show us the way to help these people. Show us the way to help all who are loved and cared about and to let them know that. And Father, we're also mindful of the world situation. We're mindful of leaders. We pray that you would be with them, that good decisions can be made. We give thanks, Father, for the church, wherever it meets, and to the leadership, and to every member. Watch over and care for us all, and help us to demonstrate love. Today we end this prayer with rejoicing, rejoicing at your presence, rejoicing over the church, the body of Christ, and rejoicing over the resurrection, which gives us hope of eternal life. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Stepped down into darkness, open my eyes, let me see beauty that made this heart adore you, hope of a life spent with you. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether loving, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. King of all days, oh so highly exalted, in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for our 
forsake became poor. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to be. sin upon that cross. I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I to say that you're my God, you're altogether loving, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. Beauty that made this heart adore you, hope of a life. God speaks to us today in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 21, and I would ask that you read along with me. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Prisia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya, belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others mocking said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice, and address them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem. Let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and my female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the Lord shall be saved.
as we enter into this time, let's do the best to put the struggles of this world out of our mind. And there are many struggles. We have the coronavirus is struggling. Many are still struggling with that. Many are struggling with being locked down, even though we're easing up on some of the restrictions. Uh, a lot of people are still having the struggles with that. There are people that are struggling because they have to go to work through all of this stuff. There's a lot of joy in the world right now because we just put two astronauts back in space. American astronauts from American soil. That's huge. We have a bunch of civil unrest going on. Um, once again, very, very unfortunate um, situation there. Uh, it, and my heart just goes out to them and the family. But now is the time that we put that aside. It's amazing, but our God is bigger, bigger than all of that. And so let's take this time. Let's put all of those worldly things out of our mind. And let's turn our mind to the cross. Let's turn our mind to Jesus hanging there on that cross for each of us. The reason he hung there on that cross and gave up his life for us was so that we have that remission of sins. It was the new covenant. That was, that was the way that God had planned it for us. And because Jesus was obedient and Jesus hung on that cross for us, we have that opportunity. So one of the things that God asks us to do is each week, let's turn our minds to that. Let's remember that. We are so forgetful as a people. We forget things what did you have for dinner last night? It may not be that memorable. But let's turn our minds and remember Jesus, a sacrifice, at the request of God for us. Will you go to God in prayer with me? Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful. Thankful that Jesus came and walked on this earth as a man. We're thankful that he was obedient to you. He showed us what it was to, to follow him. He gave us that example to follow. And in the end, he gave up his life on the cross for us. Though we were sinners, though we don't deserve it in any way, shape, or form, he did that for us. And Father, as we partake of this bread, help us to remember that sacrifice Remember that this bread represents that broken body. It was broken for each of us on that day when he hung on the cross. Please bless this bread that represents that body and that sacrifice. In this we pray through Jesus' name. Amen. Would you bow with me now as we give thanks for the cup? Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful, so thankful for everything, all the many blessings. And Father, at this time, we ask that you bless this fruit of the vine that represents that blood that was shed for each of us. And Father, we're so thankful for that new covenant and that plan that you have laid out for us. Father, this is our prayer through Jesus' name. Amen. We'd also like to take this time to give back a portion that we've received. We know that all the many blessings that we have, they all come from God. 
and he allows us to be stewards of that which we have. There are several ways that you can donate. You can go to the website, VenturaChurchOfChrist.org or VCofC.com. Both of them have links to where you can donate online. You could write a check, drop it in the mail, and send it in. Or if neither of those work for you, give Andrew or Donna a call at the office and uh, work out whatever works for you. But this is an important time that we need to make sure that we continue to give. We continue to uh, offer up that which God has blessed us with. Will you bow with me? Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for all the many blessings that you give us. And Father, we trust that the things that we do with these physical blessings are pleasing unto you. And Father, we ask at this time that you bless the giving of everyone in the congregation. And Father, we pray that this giving is acceptable unto you and that these, would, these funds would be used in a way that's well-pleasing to you. Once again, Father, just thank you. Thank you for everything. This is our prayer through Jesus. Amen. This road will be hard, but we win in the end, simply because of Jesus and us, it's not if, but when. So take joy in the journey.
Good morning again. Welcome to the uh, Ventura Church of Christ and our online worship. I'm the preacher here. My name's Andrew Hill. I am thankful that you are gathering with us virtually online. I pray that this is a blessing to you. And as we begin, let's pray. Father, we thank you for all the many ways you bless us, all the many ways you work into our hearts and our lives. God, we do ask that you would open our ears, open our eyes, open our hands, open our hearts. As we watch the news unfold, as we see the crazy things happen in this world, help us to pray. Help us to pray at that moment for those people. As we're aware of the pain and the suffering that many have been enduring for many, many years, God, help our hearts to break. Help us to be open. Help, help us to, to encourage and strengthen and to bless people who are hurting. God, you are the one who cares more than any other for those who are hurting, for those who are oppressed, for those who are beaten down. God, you want to set us all free. It's not just a story of a few, it's a story of all. The whole world is crying out to you, God. Heal our land, heal our nations, heal this world. God, we do ask that you would do that, that we would see the gospel for all this day. It's in Jesus we pray, amen. So as we begin, um, you know, we celebrate a risen Savior. We celebrate a Savior who, while he did die, and the pain he is so very aware of in his death, that he also understands the suffering we face every single day. And he was a Jew, a darker skinned man who suffered willingly, allowing himself to die for the whole world. And yet he resurrected. And we long to be more like Jesus, both in his death and in his resurrection. We've been focused on that for the, the whole year, to be more like Jesus. We, we've studied through the Gospel of Mark. Uh, now we've gone through many of the ends of the Gospels, and now we're in Acts, and we're looking at how Acts plays out much the same as the Gospels, except it's now Jesus teaching through his disciples to the world. And so this is Pentecost. This is the day of Pentecost. Um, and as we deal with Pentecost, I want you to consider the blessing of um, this, this newness that happened when the church was realized in its most powerful form to go out into the world. But as we start there, I want to I wanna back up for a minute and I want to look at the context of Pentecost from another perspective. Um, in, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image and our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and of the birds of the air, over the livestock and over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Now, the difficulty is with our gospel, we often start at the fall in chapter three. We talk about original sin or the first sin or the fact that the whole world has sinned as Romans Chapter 3 says that we have all fallen short of the glory of God, but we rarely like to deal with the original blessing. I don't know why that is. Are we afraid of, of goodness? Because the original blessing was that God created us to be like Him in His image. All humanity, everyone, male and female, are made to be like God. Isn't that amazing? But then we get wrapped up in the fall. And I think the issue is this. If you post something hateful on Facebook, it will get more interaction than if, than if you post something loving. You have to be incredibly kind and generous and, and overwhelmingly, wonderfully amazing and giving away money to get more and more appreciation or likes or interaction or anything from Facebook or YouTube or whatever social media you use. 
And you'll notice that our news cycle is built on this too. The negativity wins. Whatever's the most painful, the most difficult, the most in your face is often what is going to be um, promoted as the lead story of the day. So when we look at the fall or the stumble, the great big horrible trip up, because we didn't completely get destroyed. Yes, we lost the grace of God to be without sin, but um, Adam and Eve were, were, were not completely destroyed. They, they do die, but I believe they'll come back to life too, just like the rest of us, that we're all gonna be raised to new life. But in what degree, I, I don't know. Um, but Adam and Eve ate that fruit. Adam was right there with her. He can't say, oh, I didn't do that. He did, and he watched her do it. And so male and female together are responsible for the fall. And as they did that, there were some consequences. And, and then not too many chapters later, there's the flood where God is sick of the world and just says, we're done. And we like to tell that in a nice, clean way. But, you know, everybody but Noah and his family that got on the ark dies. That's horrific, painful. And then after the flood, it very quickly, the nations grow again and again, but not nations, the nation, one nation. And they thought, hey, why don't we get together? The Tower of Babel comes out in Genesis chapter 11. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. And they did. And they built a tower to heaven. And they said, let us, let us build ourselves a city, verse 4, with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But that was actually God's desire, was that e Eden, the garden originally, with the original blessing was that as they had more and more children, the garden's edges would spread out and get into the whole world. And as they got into the whole world, what would happen? God's joy and blessing would increase and show itself throughout the whole world. But instead, after the fall, the tumble, if you want to call it that, some people do, but um, then after the flood, and then there's the Tower of Babel, the, the, like three strikes, oh my goodness, this is a pain, right? Um, the Lord came down to see that city, and he says this, if as one people speaking the same language, they have been able to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over the, all the earth because that was the original plan that they would scatter. And so God says, you won't? Well, then I'll help you. Confusing the language and sending them away. And he does. And, and from there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. And very quickly, we come to the story of Abraham, or Abram as it begins. But his, the, the main point of the story of Abram, or Abraham, is this, that he will be blessed to be a blessing. That he, in, in verse 3 of chapter 12, it says, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse. And all, and this is the issue, all, all peoples. Before there was only one people, now there's multiple nations, multiple languages, multiple ways of speaking, and multiple ways of understanding the world, multiple views of life. But all peoples on earth will be blessed through you, Abraham. And this is the greater issue, that we are blessed to be a blessing because through Abraham, the whole world gets to know this guy, Jesus, the Messiah. And so as we move forward and we're looking at... Um, this idea, this powerful idea of Pentecost, I wanted to set the stage for all those things because what we find very quickly is, is um, a remaking of the world. It is, if you will, Jesus' resurrection is like a new garden is being pushed into the world, a new understanding of the flood, if you will, a new understanding of the Tower of Babel. And this, the gospel for all in Acts chapter two, verse one through 21, I believe is a, a push on God to say, you remember the Tower of Babel? Well, let's bring that forward and let's change it. Let's bring everybody back together. 
So verse 1, when the day of Pentecost came and um, they were all together in one place, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And this is the Spirit. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So the Holy Spirit was on them like a fire. And and I grew up with little tongues over top their head, but I'm wondering if not their whole body looked like it was glowing in a flame. I'm wondering if, if not each of them, that resting on them was literally on their whole body. And like they were like the burning bush. They were being called into action by the Holy Spirit and saying, hey, pay attention, people. This is something big. Pay attention. Look at this. And then there were saying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven, When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment. They were wondering, what's this big loud noise? Just like you, uh, if there's some crash, boom, bang outside my house, um, I'm going, what's what's this? If there's some loud ruckus in the street, I'm I'm like, whoa, hey, uh, this is not the time for the garbage truck to come by. and, And what's all that noise? And everybody runs out and looks. And so they come together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Now, that is an amazing miracle that that all these men and possibly women are speaking in languages that they had not studied and everybody's hearing it in languages of their own. And there's, pay attention to that languages business there because in the Tower of Babel, you'll remember God said, let's confuse their language. And here God says, Let's make sure they understand in their own language. And in some sense, God is reworking that idea and bringing out and back together the people of all the earth. Now, utterly amazed, they ask, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Aren't they these local hicks? Because Galilee was not like a prominent thing. It was a lower grade kind of place. Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Now, we skipped a few verses there because I just didn't want to read through all the names of all the places, but there was a whole bunch of them all over the world, right? At least all over the Mediterranean Rim, into Africa, and up into Europe, and parts of Asia. Everybody was gathered, and they're all hearing it, and they're asking, what does this mean? Verse 13, some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Have you noticed that there are people that just have to tease, make fun of, belittle others when something amazing and different is happening? And they just push and poke and mess with and they, they, can't, they can't be amazed. They have to destroy. That's, that's sad, isn't it? But they, they're trying to discredit them. And a part of the reason they're trying to discredit them is because those people are probably going, oh, these are the followers of Jesus and we don't want to hear from them. Um, we, we, we don't want their case to be present to the world. We don't want people to understand what they're actually trying to say. So let's destroy them in some way. And then uh, Peter stood up with the 11. Remember, they're not exactly 12. Well, there's this Mattathias guy that was supposed to come in, but why is he not mentioned? But Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. Did you notice how he shaped that? All of you who are here paying attention, please please pay closer attention. Let me explain what's happening. Let me, please listen carefully. Sometimes when things are really big and really difficult, you don't want to just run into them. You need to back up and say, hey, Let's pause for a minute. Let's hear what's being said and let's think about it. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. Wow. That, that's difficult. 
We don't often focus on these verses because they make us uncomfortable because we're not exactly sure what to do with them. But if this passage of Joel is right, and if we go back to Genesis chapter 1, the original blessing, and if we believe in, as Peter said, the priesthood of all believers, it's highly possible that the women in the upper room were also prophesying. Uh, because, I don't know, it appears that everybody got the gift of the Spirit that was in that room. Now, that's just a possibility. But the other is this, that Joel says, and uh, is, it, is it Peter here? Isn't it Peter talking? Peter, yeah, he stood up with the 11. He said, um, these people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Well, I've also known people who were drunk at nine in the morning. So, but he's saying this is fulfilling prophecy. This goes back to Joel who says that I will pour out my spirit on all people, which is reminiscent of Moses back in the Exodus saying, I wish that everyone was given the gift to prophesy. Wow. You remember there was a bunch of people that were supposed to come to Moses with their censer and they were supposed to prophesy, but a couple people stayed in the camp and they still had their censer and they were prophesying in the camp and, and some people got upset and ran to Moses and said, hey, they're doing what they're not supposed to over there in the camp. They're supposed to be here. Should we destroy them? What should we do with them? I don't know. And Moses says, no, no, no. Praise God that they're prophesying. I wish everyone would prophesy. And so I think the bigger issue here is when and where and how. For some, it's uncomfortable. But I think that's the question we need to deal with. But what I want to focus on today is this, though. All people, all nations, all languages, all races, all ethnic groups, that is the bigger picture for this day. I will pour out my spirit in, in those days, and they will prophesy, all people from everywhere. Now, some of you are going to say, but hold on. Aren't they just Jews? But you'll also need to remember that they have been in a diaspora. They have been sent out um, from Jerusalem, from Israel, and they're coming from all these foreign cities into Jerusalem. And you'll remember this, that these folks likely intermarried with the others around them because while they tried not to, they did. <laughs> and so in that intermarriage, that is a, a representation of all nations, right? Um, you know, they, they want to claim pure bloodlines, but, but honestly, we know by DNA tests that some of the people who claim to be, you know, 100% white or 100% black or 100% whatever, it's very rare. Most everybody has some integrated blood, if you will. All people are one nation in reality. I mean, one all people are one race. We all are related. We, we all are together in this. So God saying, I will pour out my spirit on all people is a huge deal. Saying the Jews aren't the only ones. And you'll remember in the prophets, if you have read the prophets anytime um, or, or heard them preached, where God says, it's a too little of a thing for me to save only the Jews. I'm saving all the nations, all the people of the whole world. I want all of them. And you'll remember John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, that's everyone, that he sent his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And that is the challenge. So, and I'm skipping over those other verses because they also make me uncomfortable. And, and it's a different kind of passage that we're not dealing with today. The idea of what are the signs and the symbols and the blood and the moon and the stars and all that. We're, we're not dealing with that today. We're dealing with everyone. And everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. And this is the bigger issue of it all. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. Now, how do you call on the name of the Lord? Well, they ask that at the end of chapter 2, um, somewhere around verse, uh, let's see here. What should we do? What should we do? Brothers, what shall we do? This is verse 37. 
When the people heard that they were the ones that crucified Jesus, the Messiah, the Lord, um, and the Christ, the chosen one, they said, what shall we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And so... Um, with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And later, there was even more people baptized and brought into the family of God. And so it's interesting that calling on the name of the Lord is in a submission to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus in water, in this flood, if you will, a sense of... I will be saved through my own death. I have to give my life up so that I can gain life in Christ. And isn't that what Romans talks about? Romans 6, that didn't you die to yourself? And haven't you been raised to new life? Aren't, aren't you now living the life of Jesus? And so this is the struggle. This is the overwhelming struggle that everyone is welcome into the family of God. And you say, well, that's not a struggle for us in Ventura today. That's not, that's not for us. But it's for all people everywhere because we always tend to go to our own, the ones who look like us, the ones who talk like us, the ones who allow us to be us, the ones who make us comfortable. And so the challenge is to go to those who don't look like us, don't talk like us, and welcome them in because in Revelation it says every language, every tongue, every nation will be represented before the throne. All people of the whole earth will worship the Messiah in heaven. And so the question for us is how will we as a church embody that scene in heaven now? How do we reach more people of many ethnic groups and say, everyone, everyone needs to call on the name of the Lord. Not just the people who make me comfortable, not just the people who make me feel good, not just the people who, who help me feel at home and at peace, but those who might cause me to feel uncomfortable. How do we, how do we reach those folks? Well, Galatians 3.28 is a powerful verse that Paul also wrote. It says, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, no, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. All of us are called to unite in Christ Jesus. You know, one thing about this Sunday that's very interesting to me is the way that every church around the nation is responding to the news of what's been happening in the last few days. And I, I thank our elders, um, Keith and, and uh, Brent and Bruce. I, I thank them, and especially Keith, because he talked about this, that there is a civil unrest and that there is a family of, of George Floyd, Floyd who is heartbroken because they lost someone they love. And I think there is a powerful change coming in America. And, I don't know what it's gonna look like, and, and that makes me uncomfortable. I don't know how this is gonna play out. Just like we don't know how the coronavirus is gonna play out, we, we don't understand what's happening. We know that there are cities being um, set on fire, and there's awful things happening, but those were originally peaceful protests, and somebody came in and, and overtook them, and, and there's now video being shown of certain individuals wearing all black going around intentionally breaking windows and setting fires like and they're they're not the people that were protesting so people have come in and destroyed what was a healthy vibrant way to express remorse and pain and ask for change and then somebody took that and destroyed it and of course there's bad people everywhere there's there's bad people involved with all of this from from all sides and and they're, they're, they're fighting over how do we deal with this. I think the, the awkward thing for me, I'm, the awkward thing for me is I've, I've only been here for just about a year. And I love this church and I love this city. 
And I know Ventura doesn't have the difficulties that LA has, <laughs> that uh, San Francisco and, and Denver and DC and, and New York, I mean, we are not those places. And yet, we're called to embrace everyone for the sake of the gospel. And so even as I hear that, you know, George Floyd was a Christian, I think, oh. even if he wasn't a Christian, I think, oh, for the whole nation to watch. And I mean, of course, not every single person, but most everyone has seen some image of his death. And there's a collective grieving over what's going on with this virus. And now there's a collective grieving over what's going on in our nation because people are, are cheating the system of healthy and legitimate protest. And at the same, there's others that are taking advantage of, of that and causing riots and, and wreaking havoc, havoc. And I just keep going back to, we are all one. How do we love others enough to show them that we are one in Christ Jesus? I'm reminded of a black man who would go to Klan KKK rallies and he would befriend the men at those rallies and invite them to his home and show them the hoods of, uh, uh, that he had on his wall of other Klan members that have given their hoods to him because he befriended them and helped them to see that he too was a man, that he wasn't a dog. And I think, wow, that man has a powerful message. He, his, his goal, his calling by God is to go and help people see that he is a man that he is a man and that they can be friends and they become friends and the clansmen give up their clan identity and hand over their hoods. And I'm going, wow, isn't that what this is about? There is neither Jew nor Gentile. We might have differences and we might worship differently and we might think about different holidays and different special days and different amazing events, but we are all one in Christ and we should find a way to invite more people who are more different from us into Jesus. And as we do that, we recognize that the pain that some of our darker skinned brothers and sisters experience is, is, is becoming highlighted. And one of the quotes that I saw is this, that racism is not getting worse, it's just getting filmed. And that was by Will Smith. And I think that is, that is awful, that is painful. And here's, here's the thing, brothers and sisters. I don't want the news to guide our sermons. But at the same, as I keep hearing of the unrest and the constant tension in our world, I think we have to speak about it. And we have to say Jesus is the answer. And I think that a part of all that is that we are also the answer. You've seen images, hopefully by now, of, of black men standing around police officers, protecting them because there was mobs trying to get at them and they were separated from the other police officers. And you've seen other men of color saying to people breaking windows, hey, don't do that. It's not a part of what we're about. And they're trying to, to not have violence. And I think that is what we are all called to, to stand in the gap, to protect the people that others want to hurt, to find a way to speak out in a kind, peaceful, loving way, and to say, enough. And I think overwhelmingly, some of us, the only way that we can really do that is through prayer, through some sort of a social media post possibly. But I know some of us can't go out into the streets and, and do these things. I mean, to help protesters or to protect protesters or to do whatever, that's, that's not our calling. And I'm not asking you to do that, but I am asking you to pray. And as you do that, I wanna encourage you to consider what is a proper form of protest from a Christian perspective? I don't have an answer to that. I think about Martin Luther King. He was a, a man of God, and he encouraged people to be nonviolent 
but to expose the racism. And he was asking basically for it to get so violent that when they filmed it, the whole world would be shocked and, and amazed. And well, that's, that's going on today because everybody, everybody has a cell phone, right? <clears throat> and everybody's filming. And that's what I've seen the whole way through all of this mess. Second question is, how can you love others in these difficult times? How can you love and bless? We are called to be, a ble to be blessed, to be a blessing, to help others. <clears throat> Nike, <clears throat> pardon me. Nike put out a new slogan, don't do it, um, with a whole new video that's about anti-racism, basically. And I think that's interesting. Corporate media, is that playing off of, trying to win people over to their side? Are they uh, doing this for, for attention, or are they doing this to help the cause of healing our nation? And I think that's the bigger issue of it all. I long for heal, healing of our nation. And whoever's doing that, presenting that, I think, praise God. I think, what, what can we get? How can we get more people on board to, to push together and to unite our nation, our land, to push us into a, a loving embrace of others, <clears throat> kind and generous, at the same time asking for justice and righteousness, because those are the same word in Hebrew and Greek, justice and righteousness, that those two things go together, that you don't have goodness without a God who judges. So I, I want to I encourage you to consider those things. And um, we got into a few faith challenges early, proper form of uh, protest from a Christian perspective. I, I don't know what that is. And how do we love others in difficult times? But that's already in this. But faith challenges remind us to live out the gospel. They call us to find ways to be a blessing to others, to draw them into God's family. The good news is that Jesus came to bring us into relationship with God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and that we all are called to bring everyone from everywhere that we possibly can, and that's too big a task. So love your neighbor as yourself. So the other question, though, is who are you telling? Who are you sharing the message of the gospel with? Who are you inviting in? How are you inviting them? Who are you praying for? Who are you begging to know God? And who are you begging God that God would show up in their lives and, and show them Jesus? So, and, and this is back to the first, live out the gospel. Love God and love your neighbor. Love them enough to share the good news with them that Jesus has set us free, that he calls us to be one people, that he calls us to be together, to, to worship our creator, to recognize that male and female have a job in this to go and spread the good news, to tell others, and that we are all called to be the image of God to others, that we are called to bless them by loving them, by sharing the good news with them. <clears throat> and so, how are you living out the gospel? How are you telling others? How are you encouraging justice and righteousness in these days? How can we do that as a, as a group? I hope and pray that your heart has been challenged, blessed, encouraged. I know I don't have the answers. I know God does. And so I just keep praying for what is the next right thing for me to do. And sometimes that's hard. Sometimes that, that's painful. But I know there's an invitation by Jesus to, to do that, to build his kingdom here. And so I would like us to pray the Lord's Prayer, and then we're going to uh, sing together, build your kingdom here, and then we'll have a closing prayer. Um, so let's pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive those indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. As we continue to pray, God, I ask that you would help us to see your kingdom come, that we would welcome your kingdom, that we would pray for your kingdom, that this earth would that the people of this earth would turn back to you and that 
your will would be done throughout this nation. I, I, God, have been blessed to see people who are volunteering to go out into the city streets after the riots and clean them up. And God, I ask for more people to do that, to go out and to clean them up. God, we ask that more people would honor the, <clears throat> the curfews that are being imposed and the, <clears throat> the health and the wellness issues that need to happen so that the, the firefighters and the first responders can get through. But God, we also ask that you would challenge the system that we live in today. We know that this system is getting the results that it's set up to get. And we ask that you would help us to find a way to, to change and challenge a system that is not as healthy as it could be. God, we, we know that the best system is, is your kingdom's system, where we are all servants and we're not trying to promote ourselves or our agenda or our desires, but we're promoting you. God, help us. Help us to promote you. <clears throat> help us to love our enemies. Help us to love our brothers and sisters throughout the whole world. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. <clears throat> and real quick, your invitation. How is God calling you to live? Maybe you'd like to text me live, L-I-V-E, live. And, and that will be your way to say, I would like prayers. I would like encouragement. I, I, I need help in learning how to surrender my life and live for God. Maybe <clears throat> this, this isn't the, the message you desired to hear this morning, but you, you know that this is what God is calling us to as a nation, to find healing, to find help in Jesus. That that is the central character of all of history. That, that Jesus is the savior the creator, and he is the sustainer. And when he returns, he will set everything right. He will fix it all. But he's also calling us to help fix it today. I ask you to, to consider and to pray. And if I can help you in any way, give me a call, text me, reach out to me, post on Facebook, whatever it is, I would, I would love to help. We're going to move into um, a song, and uh, <clears throat> then we'll have our closing prayers. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church. Yeah. 
Would you all pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the time we've had to spend and worship to you. We pray that every day our lives would be a worship to you. God, we'd ask that you'd be with us in this time, that uh, you would have uh, our leaders and our, our country uh, turn to you. God, we pray for calm, and the only way to seem to get calm would be in you. God, we ask that... Uh, you would give folks peace and uh, that they would uh, lean on you during this hard time. Watch over us in this time. Help us to show Christ in our lives. Be with us and keep us. Pick us up when we fall down. Put us back on the path. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's try that again. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't push the audio button. Let's pray, continue to pray for our, our friends uh, who are asking for prayers, um, Greg and Florence. Um, let's pray. God, we ask for your blessing and your healing to be upon Lily. We pray that the chemo would work for her. We ask that you would be with Greg and Donna and all those who are uh, caring for her and all the doctors that see her. God, we ask for uh, your hand to be with Florence, that you would heal her and help her through her pain and that you would bless her this day. God, for all those who have not spoken of their prayers, we, we ask um, that you would still bless them and watch over them. God, we do ask for a healing of our nation, of our land, of all that is going on. And we ask that one day, one day soon, all the fighting will stop because all have turned to Jesus. God, we ask for your your hand to be upon us and our nation, our land, our world for healing and for grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you for all that you do and all that you are. Uh, we're going to close with one day the song from earlier in this time of worship. Sometimes I lay under the moon and thank God I'm breathing. Then I pray, don't take me soon, cause I'm here for a reason. Sometimes in my tears I drown, but I never let it get me down. So when negativity surrounds, and I know someday it'll all turn around because all my life I've been waiting for. I've been praying for, for the people to say that we don't want to fight no more. There'll be no more wars, and our children will play. One day, one day, one day. One day. One day. Drive you crazy 
but don't let it face you, no way, no way. Sometimes in my tears I drown, but I never let it get me down. So when negativity surrounds, I know someday it'll all turn around because all my life I've been waiting for, I've been praying for, for the people to say that we don't want to fight no more. There'll be no more wars and our children will play. One day, one day, one day, one day. One day. Oh, one day. Children will play one day. One day. 